Have you ever heard it said that if something seems too good to be true, it probably is? You know, that, that email scam that, that comes and says that, oh, if you'll just send $1,000 to someone in, in Nigeria to help them escape the country, then when they come, they, they'll share their wealth with you and, and pay you back a hundredfold with $100,000. It seems too good to be true, and it is. You know, or the publisher's clearinghouse mailing that, that comes and, and it says, you've won a million dollars. I don't know how many times I've gotten that, but I've never won the, the million dollars. You know, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Well, that is if people are making those promises. But if God makes a promise that seems too good to be true, it's a promise that, that you can trust. Because God keeps his promises. This morning we're going to, to talk about some, some promises that, that God makes that, that seems to be too good to, to be true. The difference between a deal or a promise that a person makes and a deal or a promise that, that God makes may be this. When a person makes a deal with you that seems too, be, too good to be true, often they're trying to get you to do something. Often they're trying to get you to buy something. Often they're trying to get you to do something that is going to bring profit to them. They are going to benefit in some way. But, but when God makes an offer that is too good to be true, it's not because he's trying to manipulate you. It's not because he's trying to coerce you. But rather it's because he's making an offer to you of something that, that is what you need. Because God is concerned about what's best for you. you know, a parent who will do anything for, for their child to, to help them to succeed, to, to provide for them what it is that, that they need. God, our Heavenly Father, is the same way. As he makes a, a promise to us, a promise that may seem too good to be true, it's because he knows what is best for us. He knows what it is that, that we need. This morning we're going to talk about three empty things. And those three empty things connect with three promises that God makes to us. You know, even though we should be leery of, of offers that seem too good to be true, if that offer comes from God, then you can count on it. You can, can trust it. The first empty thing that I want us to consider this morning is the empty cross. You know, the cross is one of the most identifiable symbols in all the world. But if you look at the history of the cross, if you look at the history of the cross, you'll, you'll find that, that the cross was a tool of execution. The cross was a, a tool of execution used by the Romans. It was one that was, was brutal. It was one that sought to bring the most suffering, the most pain upon someone who, who was sentenced to death. Now, there have been other instruments of, of execution. There's the electric chair, there's lethal injection, there, there's the, the gallows, there, there's the guillotine, to, to name a few. But none of them have developed into a symbol that has been known worldwide and, and recognized worldwide. Why is that? It's not because the cross is recognized necessarily only as an instrument of execution, but the cross is recognized as a symbol of God's promised forgiveness. The first Easter morning, a group of women made their way to the tomb where, where Jesus was. And as they went to, to the tomb where, where Jesus was buried, they would have passed the, a hill called the Skull called Golgotha, the, the place where Jesus had been crucified. And as they walked by and saw the empty cross there, they would have remembered the, the events that happened just a, a couple days earlier, that happened on, on that Friday. They would have remembered Jesus' suffering. They would have remembered his bleeding. They would have remembered the crown of thorns. They would have remembered the, the soldier putting the, the, the spear through his side to see if he was dead. But the promise of the empty cross for you and me. The promise of the empty cross is that we can be forgiven. Now I realize that the word sin is, is not something that is, is politically correct in, in our culture in the, the day in, in which we live. 
But the Bible tells us that we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. The only person who has ever lived a perfect life was Jesus. Everyone else has failed no matter how hard they, they tried. According to, to God's law, uh, the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. Because we have sinned, what we deserve is, is death. What we deserve is eternal separation from God. And that, that place of eternal separation uh, in Scripture is called hell. But yet, even though our sins cause us to deserve to be eternally separated from God, because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, because he became the, the perfect sacrifice, you know, our sins can, can be forgiven. You know, we can have forgiveness for sins in our life because of the sacrifice that, that Christ made. In Romans chapter 5, the, the Bible says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It was upon the cross that, that Jesus offered his, his perfect life. It was upon the cross that, that he offered his sinless life as a sacrifice for our lives. No one else, not Muhammad, nor Buddha, not Moses or Abraham, not David or, or the prophet Isaiah, no one else has ever lived a perfect life that they could offer their life as a perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world. That's why the Bible tells us in the book of Acts, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to man by which we can be saved. When Jesus breathed his, his last words, he said, it is finished. You know, it is finished. He had come to earth to to be the, the perfect sacrifice. He had come to earth to, to be the sacrifice for, for our sins. When, when Jesus said it is finished, the guilt of our sins, the guilt of our sins that, that we, we deserved eternal separation from God, the guilt of our sin had been forgiven. The, the practice uh, or the promise of, of forgiveness is for, for those who, who repent of their sins and, and believe in Jesus. You know, as we put our faith in Christ, as we ask for his forgiveness, uh, the Bible tells us that, that God will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Forgiveness sounds like something that is too good to be true, but that's God's plan. That's God's offer. I don't know how many times I've I've heard someone talk about God's forgiveness, but then they'll say, but my sin is so bad, he could never forgive me. What I've done is so horrible that there's no way that, that God could, could ever forgive me. Now, now, I might believe them if they said, my sin is so bad, I don't know that I can ever forgive myself. But to say that God will not or is not able to forgive seems like, we're minimizing the sacrifice that, that Jesus made upon the cross. It, it even seems that, that we're doubting whether God is capable or willing to do what he said that he would do. The empty cross represents for us forgiveness. It represents forgiveness for my sins. It represents forgiveness for, for your sins. God's gift of forgiveness is effective for all, but we need to choose to, to receive it. You know, if you've never received or experienced God's forgiveness in your life, this morning, this Easter morning would be an opportune time for you to, to pray, for you to ask God to forgive your sins, to cleanse you from, from all your, your unrighteousness, to to ask him to, to come into your heart and life, or, or maybe he's already, you've already invited him into your heart and life, but you're recognizing that you're still holding on to, to sin that, for which you're not willing to forgive yourself. And maybe in this day, it's a day to release that to God. And not only invite his forgiveness, but also ask him to help you to forgive yourself. Let us pray.
Lord, we thank you for, for the empty cross. We thank you for, for the symbol of forgiveness that, that it is in, in our lives. But Lord, I pray that, that the forgiveness that is symbolized by, by the cross is, is more than just an intellectual exercise. I pray for that one in, in this day that, that needs to, to seek your forgiveness, needs to, to invite you into their heart and life. May they, may they take that step of, of faith in this day. And Lord, for that one who finds it difficult to forgive themselves, I pray that they might find your grace to be sufficient. I pray that they might find freedom. I pray that they might find forgiveness in this day. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. One of the things I really enjoy about the Easter story is how Jesus allows us to discover the story or to, or to hear the story instead of him coming back and standing on a huge rock and proclaiming to the world that he has risen. He does it in a way where people are allowed to discover it and hear about it themselves. And then everybody has a response. Everybody has a decision to make. How am I going to respond to this story? And so we see in the scripture that Art just read, we have women, they go up to the tomb and they discover the stones rolled away. They have a decision to make and they choose to go inside. They want to see what's happening, and when they entered, they found that it was an empty tomb, and there were two angels inside it. And the angels said to the woman, why do you look for the living amongst the dead? He is not here. He is risen. The empty tomb has so much power and so much purpose behind it. When we realize why it's empty and that Christ has risen from the grave, we see that Jesus has conquered death. We see that Jesus has been resurrected. And we understand that there is a powerful promise of eternal life that's laced through this story when you choose to believe in Jesus Christ. So I ask you this morning, much like the woman had the opportunity to consider, how are you going to respond to this story? How are you going to respond to the, ascension, to the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Are you going to hear the story and sit back and say, I heard that. That was a nice story. I'll consider it a little bit. Or are you going to choose to respond in a way that makes a difference? And respond where your life will look different because of the power in the story. Because of the grace that Christ can give to you when you choose to respond. The redemption in this story. There's another person in the story that Art read. And we see exactly how he responds. When the women go back and they tell everybody what's happened... We see a variety of responses from the disciples. One of those disciples, maybe more, they get up and they run to the tomb to see for themselves. Verse 12, Peter, however, got up and he ran to the tomb. Peter was unable to just sit back and say, nice story. I bet that means something. No, no, no. When Peter heard this, he was rocked and he was forced to respond. His body couldn't contain it. He couldn't sit still. It was so important that he experienced it himself. That's why I love Easter. I mean, the birth of Christ was an event. It was a powerful event, but it was just an event. And the life of Christ was an example. Probably one of the best examples out there, but it was just an example. It wasn't until he died that all this got meaning. It wasn't until his resurrection that all of this got purpose. Of all the events that defined the life of Jesus Christ, and there's many of them, born of a virgin, Tempted and tested in the wilderness. All of his sermons, all of his miracles, of all the events that define the life of Christ, the scriptures tell us to remember only one thing. The Bible tells us to remember only one thing, and that is Jesus' sacrificial death. Why is that? Why aren't we told to remember his birth? Why aren't we told to remember his life? Why is it that we're only to commemorate his death? And that is because in his birth, he is called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. In his death, he is called our Savior, which means God has saved us. But it's in his resurrection, he is called our Redeemer, which means God has renewed us. In birth and life, he revealed the possible. But it's in his death and it's in his resurrection, it's in the Easter story that we made it possible. 
it's not enough that Jesus was merely our teacher. Jesus had to become our Savior. He chose to become our Redeemer. His life was an incarnation. His life was a revelation. But his death spells salvation when you believe in it. His resurrection brings restoration when you allow that message to move you into a response towards Jesus Christ without Easter. Without Easter, we would only see his example. But because of Easter, we can become his example. Without Easter, we're just a bunch of good people. But with Easter in our veins, we can become holy people. We can become changed, different, validated, grace-filled, redeemed people of Jesus Christ. So I ask you this morning, how are you going to respond to this story? And I hope there's something stirring inside of you. I hope you're gut-checking where you stand with Jesus Christ because he is standing right before you and he is beckoning you to come forward. He wants to fill your life with grace. He wants to fill your life with power and it belongs in you and all he does is he calls you to believe. He calls you to live and he calls you to experience this story that he shares with us this morning. I hope when you walk out of here this morning, you've heard so much more than just a good story. You've heard an experience that can change your life if you choose to believe in it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much. Father, you have truly outdone yourself with showing us how much you love us by sending your Son here, Lord, to die for us and then to truly live so that we may as well when we believe. God, we come before you this morning not content to just hear this story, but convicted to respond, convicted to make you a part of our life in a powerful way. Lord, I ask for your presence in all these people, gathered in your name. Amen. There's one more promise that I want to talk about this morning about Easter. Uh, a promise that is symbolized by the, the empty grave cloth. After the, the angel had spoken to the women, they immediately went back to, to the apostles and, and told Peter and, and John and the others that Peter and John went running to, to the tomb. It says that as they got there, you know, Peter went in the tomb and, and he found that the, the grave cloths, those, those linen cloths that, that had been wrapped around Jesus' body, were there. They, they'd been folded. They'd been nicely placed on, on the, the slab where, where Jesus' body had been laid. It was an issue that if someone had come to, to steal away Jesus' body, they would have not only taken the, the body, but they would have also taken the grave cloths. But because the grave cloths were, were empty, because the body was no longer there, it was, was a sign that that he had, had risen, that he'd come back to, to life. You know, it wouldn't be long before Jesus himself would, would appear to, to Mary Magdalene, to the, the two who were walking on the road to Emmaus. He would appear to, to some of the, the other disciples, and, and over the course of, of the next 40 days or, or so, he, he appeared to, to over 500 people. Jesus would sit down with them. He would walk with them. He would talk with them. He would eat with them. Once again, they were able to have fellowship with the, the Lord, the, the resurrected Jesus. The promise of the, the empty burial cloths is that Jesus is, a, is alive and that we can have fellowship with him. Uh, Jesus isn't some, some nebulous force that, uh, that is out, you know, influencing the, the universe in, in some way. But he is a, a living Savior who desires to be in relationship with those who put their faith in him. You know, it, it was an issue that uh, about 2,000 years ago, Jesus was walking the, this earth in, in bodily form. God's son was, was walking on, on this earth, and people could relate to him his followers, his disciples, those who came to, to hear him teach and, and preach. Then it was 
the, the resurrected Jesus that, that walked the, the earth for about 40 days. And, and as he was walking the earth, he once again could relate to, to his disciples, to, to those who saw him, those who, who heard him, him teach. But after he ascended into heaven, you know, how is it that those since then, how is it that, that we can have fellowship with, with Christ today? Well, the way that we have fellowship with Christ today, the way we're in relationship with him, is through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, he, he promised to send the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who would come and, and would, we would have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit would make God's teaching known. You know, would lead us, would guide us. You know, the cross couldn't hold Jesus. The tomb couldn't contain him, and the burial clothes were unnecessary because Jesus was alive. Jesus taught and touched. He, he loved. He healed. You know, it was an issue that he was in relationship with people. He did it the, the day of his resurrection, and he still does it today. And the message that I want you to hear this morning is that Jesus, through the power of his Holy Spirit, wants to be in relationship with each one of us. I want to ask you a, a very important question this morning, and that question is, do you know Jesus? Do you have a, a relationship with Christ in your life? Do you know Jesus or do you only know about him? You know, it's an issue that, that we may know something about Barack Obama or about uh, George Bush or we may know something about Peyton Manning or, or about uh, Michael Jordan. But knowing about them is not the same thing as knowing them. There are people that we, we know something about but do any of us really know them? We can know Jesus. We can know his, his love, his, his care, his healing, and his forgiveness in our lives. In the book of Revelation, chapter 3, Jesus said, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and, and he with me. You know, as Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, knocks on the door of our heart, it's an issue of us responding. It's an issue of us inviting him in. It's been nearly 2,000 years since, since Jesus was crucified, buried, and, and resurrected. And on the, the first Easter morning, as the women went to, to the grave, they had no idea that day what all was going to happen to them. I'm not even sure that on that day they really understood everything that, that they were experiencing. But on that first Easter because the cross was empty, they could experience forgiveness. Because the, the grave, because the tomb was empty, it indicated a promise of eternal life. And because the grave cloths were, were empty, it was, was a, a reminder or, or a promise that Jesus was alive and, and that we too can have a relationship and, and fellowship with him. Do you know the, the freedom in your own life that, that comes with your sin being forgiven? Do you know the promise of eternal life? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? The, the story is told a, about a man who, who had purchased a, a blazer, a, a, a sport coat of some sort from, from Nordstrom's. And, and uh, as he wore it for several months, he just never liked it. It didn't fit right. He didn't like the color. It attracted lint. You know, he wore it for several months, but then he hung it in his closet, and every time he saw it in his closet, it just kind of irritated him that, it, that he had spent all that money for, for the blazer and, and never wore it. And he was always reminded of, of Nordstrom's uh, guarantee that, that if you weren't absolutely satisfied with your purchase, you could return it. You know, you could exchange it. Oh, he thought, you know, I've worn it several times, and um, you know, surely they wouldn't, wouldn't honor that, uh, that uh, guarantee. But, but he said, you know, I just don't like it. I, I'm going to put them to the test. I'm going to see if they'll keep their promise. And so he practiced a speech, and, 
and uh, took it back to, to the, the Nordstrom store, and as he walked into the men's department, he found the first salesman, and he began saying, you know, I bought this several months ago, I've worn it several times, but I don't like it, I don't like the color, I don't like how it fits, I don't like the way it uh, collects lint all the time. He said, I'd like to exchange it, will you honor your, uh, your guarantee? The salesman just kind of smiled, shook his head, and he said, my heavens, what took you so long to bring it back? You know, God offers us the gift of salvation. We may know about the, the promise. We may know about the gift. But to some this morning, God is saying to you, my heavens, what's taken you so long to receive my gift? What is it that's keeping you from receiving God's gift of salvation in your life? You know, in the book of Romans, it says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you've never accepted God's promise, if you've never invited Christ into your life, if you've never experienced his forgiveness, what have you been waiting for? Today would be a perfect day to invite him into your heart and, and into your life. Next week, we're going to be starting a, a series that we're calling Momentum. It's going to be talking about kind of next steps. You know, the story doesn't end with Easter, but, but the story moves on as, as the resurrected Jesus uh, continued to interact with the disciples and, and even help them to deal with their, their doubts and, and their questions. You know, in a couple weeks, we're, we're going to talk about the uh, the Holy Spirit, God's presence with us in the here and now, how it is through the power of the Holy Spirit that we can have fellowship with Jesus. This morning, if you're sensing the, the Holy Spirit stirring in your heart and life, saying, you know, why have you been waiting so long? Why have you been waiting to, to embrace God's promises? Let me invite you to, to offer a simple prayer, to invite Christ into your heart and life, and I pray that, that this might be an Easter that you experience God's promises to their fullest. Let us pray. Lord, as we come to you in this day, I, I pray that all those gathered might experience your promises to their fullest. Lord, for that one who has never experienced forgiveness in their life, for, for that one who has never invited Christ in, for for that one who doesn't know what fellowship with you is like. I pray that today is a change. I pray that today is a new day. I pray that today is a new beginning in their relationship with you. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen.